Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to Carnegie. Today we're going to uh, discuss recent protests in Iraq. As we have seen from the recent developments in the Arab world, no country really uh, is immune from uh, 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 these protests, and whereas each country has different circumstances and different demands. We have seen protests uh, spread to many, if not most, uh, Arab countries since the beginning uh, of this year. Uh, so is the, are the protests in Iraq different uh, than elsewhere? Are they a sign of political maturity in Iraq or a failure, or a failure of democracy? Uh, and what role will these protests and potential violence play as the U.S. draws down its military presence in Iraq. Present uh, with us to discuss all these issues and more are three experts uh, on Iraq. Uh, Marina Ottaway, uh, who is the director of our Middle East program at Carnegie, uh, has worked on issues of political transformation in the Middle East and on Gulf security, and is a longtime analyst on the formation and transformation of political systems. She has written on political reconstruction in Iraq, Afghanistan, Balkans, and African countries. Uh, and then after Marina, we will have Denise Natalie, who is the Minerva Fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. Denise has f lived for the past uh, 20 years, worked and conducted independent research in the Kurdish regions of Iraq, Turkey, Iran, and Syria and is the author of numerous publications on Kurdish nationalism, polit politics, economy, and identity. And our third speaker today is Henri Barki, who is also a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Middle East program and <coughs> a fellow at, uh, 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 sorry, a professor at Lehigh University. He has been a member of the policy planning staff in the State Department and uh, has taught at Princeton, Columbia, the State University of New York, and UPenn. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marina. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am going to limit my remarks to, uh, uh, to the, I don't know, the Iraq proper. I'm not going to talk about Kurdistan, in other words. The, uh, Denise and Henri will uh, turn their attention to what is happening in the north, so that what I have to say does not apply at all to that, uh, uh, to that part of the country. And I'll try to, uh, to raise some broad issues uh, about what has been happening, the meaning of what has has been happening and where it is leading, essentially. It, I'll try to paint, uh, to paint a fairly broad brush stroke picture of what has been going on rather than going into details in what is a rather uh, complex uh, uh, situation, particularly complex because contrary to what is happening, to what we see in most countries, this is not just a struggle between the government and the protester. This is a challenge to the government by the protester, which then has triggered wave of repercussion in terms of uh, uh, consequences within the governing alliance in the relationship between the central government and the regional government. Uh, so it's a much more complex picture what, uh, which is uh, uh, what is emerging. And if I were to tell you that I think I know where it's going, I don't have the slightest idea. So let's make, I want to make that clear at the beginning that I find it difficult to see what the ultimate uh, consequences of this are going to be. What is behind the protest in Iraq is pretty much the same that is uh, behind the protest everywhere else. People are tired of the situation they have. They are tired of governments, essentially, that are not governing. That is, governments that are engaged. Uh, I would argue in the case of Iraq, we are seeing a case of pure politics devoid of policy. What I mean is that since before the elections in uh, 2010, in March of 2010, Iraqi politicians have been in, uh, engaged simply in a struggle about 
who gets what among themselves. In other words, who gets, who gets more the votes than who gets what positions in the government. And none of the, this has had any reference to what the needs of the country are. In other words, the struggle has been on people and not on, uh, and the people getting post and not about policies that they would enact. So that I would argue what we are seeing in Iraq is a government that has done very little governing in terms of actually addressing the problems of the country for many, many months. It's very interesting that the protest on uh, March 7th, uh, which was the anniversary uh, the, the anniversary of uh, the, the election was called, you know, the, the all Arab countries these days have a day of rage, right? It's supposed to be a day of rage in Saudi Arabia today and so on. And the Iraqis had their day of rage on the 25th of February, but the protest of March 7th was called a day of regret. And the idea was people were demonstrating to uh, express their regret at having participated in elections that led nowhere. And I think, in a sense, it tells you something about, uh, the, about the mood in the country that this government is not, uh, is not governing. Uh, very briefly, when the protest started in the early February, clearly a reaction to what was going on elsewhere in the country, same means used to try to... Uh, to get people out into the streets. The protests have never been very large. We don't know what's going on today. It's too early in the day to have news about, uh, this is Friday, of course, so they are like, uh, again, it was supposed to be another big day of protest. We don't know what is happening, but certainly Iraq has not seen, at least not in the southern part of the city, not in the, uh, the, of, the, of the country, the kind of massive crowds that we have seen in some other countries in some other countries of the region. In most cases, what has been reported is crowds of a few thousand, sometimes only a few hundred. But what is very interesting is this has had that this very modest protest have had a, a real repercussion. And here, I think you are beginning to see the differences between a country that has at least formally democratic institution and countries that do not have formally democratic institution. Because the response has been, in a sense, much more significant, I would argue, than the demonstration itself appeared to be uh, at the beginning. At least uh, that is my take, my take on this. The, uh, and let me try to give you a rundown of the reactions of various actors here, because as I said, this is not a government versus the protesters. There are a lot more actors involved in the situation. But let me start with Maliki. Let me start with, uh, uh, with the central government and Maliki in particular. Maliki's, for, uh, Maliki's reaction was immediate. He responded immediately to, to the demonstrations. In other words, uh, by, uh, you know, the, the day after the demonstration started, he, uh, he showed that he was very aware of how this protest can escalate and get out of control. He was very careful. And his first reaction, uh, and he reacted on a number of uh, fronts. First, uh, with the usual uh, populist concessions that, uh, uh, that government made, but there was a difference that he is, uh, uh, he is the leader of a country where there is a due process, there is a parliament that has to approve a budget, so that you could not uh, simply go out and say we are going to raise everybody's salary by 15% as many leaders in the Arab world have uh, has done. He had limited things that he could control, and one of those that he could control was his own salary. And he uh, issued immediately a statement that he was going to cut his salary by 50%. And he incited other members of his government and members of parliament to, to follow. Uh, to follow in his footsteps. So you have this. Uh, he also announced that as soon as the, uh, uh, the budget was approved, then they would move to create uh, jobs. And per usual, creating jobs in the Arab world does not mean trying to stimulate uh, the economy so that the private sector will create uh, jobs. It means hiring more government employees, adding to the government, uh, to the government payroll. As far as I know, Nobody has been hired to this day. They keep on repeating that they will hire, but that has not happened. 
Secondly, he announced, not, not the first day, but uh, uh, shortly thereafter, he announced that, that all government departments would have 100 days to show some real improvement and real results. Now, this again, it's a very vague statement. There was never any benchmark set. He never set targets for anybody. But it was essentially an attempt to say we are responding to what? To the dissatisfaction. We are responding to, uh, we are responding to the discontent. At the same time, also, uh, he, in keeping with some of the, uh, uh, you know, of his style so far, he also uh, issued warnings about the dangers of what was happening, the disorders in the streets, and so on and so forth. Now, he also tried, and this where the, it becomes in, interesting in terms of the, the politics of the country, he also tried to deflect the discontent onto the provincial councils, and to some extent to the local governments. Uh, Iraq does not just have an elected central government, has elected the provincial councils. If you remember, they were elected in 2009. Uh, local government councils have not, which were always formed in a rather strange way, but they have not been uh, renovated for six years now. So there is certainly a, uh, you know, room there for do some. But Maliki tried to essentially transfer the blame for what was happening on the provincial councils. And he started talking about the, uh, uh, started uh, raising the idea of having early election for the provincial councils. Provincial councils have only been in power for two years at this point. So that it's, they were elected two years ago. So that it's not that they have overstayed their mandate, but essentially it was an attempt to deflect the attention away from the central government and onto the provincial governments. As the, uh, uh, the uh, um, no, and also an immediate reaction was that by Moqtada Sadr and his people, that he, as soon as Moqtada Sadr finds himself in a very interesting position right now, because in the division of the ministries, when the government was formed, uh, the Sadrists went for uh, uh, try to get control of service ministries. They did not go for the so-called sovereign ministries. They did not try to get foreign affairs or uh, defense and so on. Probably they would not have gotten them in any case. But they focused on the service ministries. And the idea was that uh, serv uh, service ministries give you direct contact with the population, essentially. You can, uh, you can learn a lot of points for good behavior by providing good services to the population. The problem, of course, is that if you, the population is complaining against the services, then you are in a tough spot, because then the, the danger is that the sadris are the ones who are going to be blamed. And he moved very quickly, to, therefore, to distance himself from the protest, or to side with the protester, and he, came up with this idea that he should, that there should be a referendum, whatever that means, because it's really not a referendum, to sound out the population about what they think about the, uh, the way in which uh, services are being delivered and what their, their needs are compared to what is being delivered. So essentially this idea of direct democracy, we are going to talk directly to the people, they tell us what they need, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, as the protest continued and the protest escalated, there were other consequences that started uh, being felt in terms of the relations. Uh, nothing changed in terms of the, well, to th uh, let me backtrack a moment. As the protest continued, it started taking on a more political character. I mean, and this is what we have seen in all countries. People start complaining about the lack of jobs, and the next thing they know, you know, they are complaining about the government, essentially, because the two are inevitably linked. But as the as the, uh, uh, the protest became more political, and it never escalated hugely in terms of numbers, but it clearly became more political. Uh, you had more political parties, not just Moqtada Sadr, but other people in the governing alliance try to distance themselves from the government. And what in particular, what we, uh, uh, what we saw is Iraqia, which always had a very tenuous position in the government, that always had a very, uh, a very, uh, uh, 
margin that felt had been marginalized started taking new steps not only to distance itself from the government, but also, I would say, saw an opportunity perhaps to get what it did not get in the first place. That is, that it, was, uh, that it could be Iraqia to form the governing, the governing alliance rather than, the, uh, uh, rather than Maliki himself. Uh, what, uh, what we have seen is an intense period of uh, uh, talks, for example, of contacts between Iraqia and Muqtada Sadr and Hakim. In other words, if you go back to the time of the government formation, these were the contacts that were taking place, essentially. Everybody, was, you had both Iraqia on one side, Iyad Alawi on one side, and Maliki and the state of law on the, the other side that, that were courting the other political parties trying to put together an alliance. And there is an element of that coming back. Now, I don't think it's going to get very far because as part of this process of consultation and so on, Iraqia his, itself has split. There are now nine members, the eight members of Iraqia that has uh, step uh, uh, stepped out of the organization, they have called this, uh, they have formed this so-called white block. Uh, we think that white might in, uh, mean the purity of the, uh, that they have clean hands, but um, we, I'm really, this is a hypothesis because it's not quite clear what the, uh, what the name means. Uh, so they have taken, uh, 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 so Iraqia has fewer people. At the same time, more and more of the people that are allied with Iraqia are taking their distance from the government. Salal Mutlak, uh, who is one of the deputy prime ministers, uh, uh, Sunni representative, was one that had been banned, one of the candidates that had been banned for being a former Baathist and then he was reinstated, always a very problematic member of the alliance, has now come out with a statement uh, saying the, uh, uh, saying the, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, Maliki cannot demonstrate an improvement in what uh, the government is delivering within 100 days, 100 days that uh, Maliki had called for, then he should step down as a prime minister and give somebody else the chance to form the government. Now, what does all this mean? I mean, uh, there are a lot more detail, but it's a, bit, it's a confusing enough picture. So the question is, what, what do we see in this? What does it mean? Uh, and where, where is it leading to? First of all, what it means is we are beginning to see very clearly the difference between protest in a formally democratic system from protest in a system that is not a democratic. It's not that the, that, the, uh, that the Iraqi government is delivering better than other governments. It's not that the Iraqi government seems to be more responsible to its citizens, more resp both responsible and responsive to its citizens than more authoritarian governments. After all, people had to march in the streets before anybody started listening to what, to what they had to say, which is the typical situation in authoritarian governments. But what it means is that there are that, that the confrontation is that, that as people start protesting, it does not turn into a direct confrontation between one government, one monolithic government, and angry people on the other side. But the, this uh, uh, sort of it becomes a confrontation between angry citizens on one side and one government which is much more able to deflect the anger because they play games with each other. The uh, central government, Maliki, tries to blame the, the provincial councils. The provincial councils say, no, thank you, it's not our fault, it's your fault, essentially. The money comes from the center and so on. The various members of the alliance try to take steps in order to blame it on each other and so on. So it's the government, in a sense, what I think we are seeing is in a situation in which the protests are much less likely to have a direct effect. They might, because it is all being absorbed in essentially another round of what I would call pure politics. That is, the joking among the parties for the, uh, this time for passing the blame around rather than for uh, gaining positions. And 
I think one of the, uh, uh, the dangers of the situation is that the protest, rather than trying to force the government to, uh, in, the, in, the, in the best case scenario, it's going to force the government to start focusing on, uh, you know, the services that the, uh, that the, uh, uh, the government has to deliver, the fact that, that the, you know, the country is not producing electricity, the fact that a lot of the service is in shambles and so on. In the worst case scenario, it's simply going to, to lead to a new round of pure politics. And right now, I think I see a lot of the pure politics. There is a lot of talk about improving services, but I do not see very much in terms of concrete measures. The fact that everybody continues talking about 100 days to improve the situation, but nobody has established any benchmarks. Improve the situation, what? What does it mean? What do we mean about uh, the uh, ministries have to uh, uh, have to show that they are improving the, uh, their services within 100 days. So essentially, we are, in, a, in many ways, what the protests have done, they have reopened all the battles that were fought at the time of the government formation and without any, re really creating any forward, uh, any forward momentum. Uh, I have not talked at all, I'm going to stop here. I'd like to point out that I have not talked at all about what's happening in the North, which I think really needs to be factored in in terms of, the, in, in order to understand what's happening in Iraq, because the two protests, which are quite different, are actually playing against each other, and I think we'll hear a lot more about that from Denise. Okay, thank you very much, Marina. That's a good transition to Denise. Uh, thank you. This is, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this seminar. Um, I'm glad that Marina started off with differentiating the southern and central regions from the protests occurring in the north. Because when we ask, um, is Iraq next, the first thing that came to my mind is which part? Because if we look at the nature of the protests in all of Iraq, and Marina has clearly um, shown that the southern and central regions has its distinct nature, you will see a very fragmented and regionalized protests that um, what is distinct to the southern and central regions really is not occurring in the north. There are some similarities, which I will, will um, um, discuss, but the differences between what the Kurds in the north are uh, demanding where the demonstrations and how the demonstrations and opposition is taking place and what the nature of the opposition is, um, leaves you questioning that there really are uh, two different and very localized opposition movements. Um, while most Iraqis are calling for, uh, again, an end to corruption, just like the Kurds, um, each of these protests, southern and central Iraq, I'm saying versus the north, are being conducted by different populations that are targeting two different governments. Southern and central Iraq are Baghdad and the northern provinces toward the KRG, the Kurdistan Regional Government. No Kurd is directing his demands at Maliki, nor are any Arab groups complaining about the Kurdistan regional government. Since Marina has, again, done the overview of Iraq, I'd like to focus on the nature of the opposition movement um, in the Kurdistan region um, and the particularities, so then we can compare this part to, to the rest of Iraq and, and the rest of the Middle East. At first glance, it does seem, and, and much attention has been given to the Kurdistan region, um, is it following the rest of the Middle East? And, and my answer is no, uh, that there are important limitations to the nature of the opposition, um, which are inherent in the, in the social structure, the lack of a real civil society, um, the schizophrenic nature of the opposition itself, lack of consciousness of citizenship rights, um, the tribalized structure of society, and this strong commitment still to Kurdish nationalism. And what you're seeing is in an opposition that is as strongly committed to Kurdish nationalism as it is with an underdeveloped or quasi-sense of citizenship rights is its own worst enemy. So um, I want to go through again um, what this opposition is about and uh, how different and similar it is to the rest of Iraq. I'd like to just point out, too, that Iraq itself is already functioning in a very weakened state. The central government is probably, you know, this is the weakest form of federalism probably in the world, where the central government already is in a very weakened state. And the Kurds, even before these demonstrations, have been taking as much advantage as possible 
of the, the powers that have been given to them in this constitution. And this is what this opposition is operating in. So now, who is this opposition in the North and what is it about? Um, there are similarities to what is going on in the rest of Iraq, indeed. Um, there's largely comprised of you know, disgruntled students, youth, uh, activists, independent, anybody who has claims against the government for not getting enough goods and services. Corruption, increasing authoritarianism, you've, you've heard these themes before. You've got now the Islamic Union, this is not uh, unfamiliar, linking up with Goran, the opposition movement, Yikurd too is very active, and now diaspora Kurds are getting involved. Um, they found a square, I've been in Suleimania for many years, but now Sarah Square has become famous, and making demands like other disgruntled populations in the Middle East, whether in Iraq <coughs> or, or, or Egypt. Um, one of the distinct features of this, though, um, is about this political party monopolization. There are things that are different. You haven't heard this in the rest of the rock. Across the board, people are fed up about the Kurdistan D Democratic Party and the PUK, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, Barzani and Talibani's groups respectively, controlling and monopolizing all forms of power and authority. And this is probably one of the main themes running throughout uh, these opposition movements. Now, in the beginning, they were not talking about, um, they wouldn't even dare mention Barzani and overthrowing the government. And that has not been a theme of the protesters. But interestingly, uh, after the first round of protests in which a, a boy was killed or a couple of people were killed, they're still not clear. Now they've upped the demands, the protesters, to we want the people who killed the protesters to be put on trial. This is now one of the new demands. And then, of course, the whole entire University of Suleimania has now called a strike. And one of their interesting new claims was, or, or, or themes, is the go away Barzani. And they had many signs up, which was not the case in the, in the, in the beginning as well. And, um, and of course, like Maliki, uh, the KRG, the Kurdish authorities, were very clever about keeping this in a very localized way. Maliki, you know, interestingly or cleverly, made road blockades, made sure that it took the protesters, you know, four kilometers to get to Baghdad, to get to water. So they, they intentionally kept this localized as well. And the same thing in, in, in Suleimania. There were roadblocks put up. No, nobody, you know, the University of, of Salahuddin in Erbil is closed for a month. No students from Suleimania were allowed to come up to Erbil. You know, they, even, even with the other distinctions I will talk about in a minute, there were intentions made by the, by the leadership to keep this confined to localities. And of course, the KRG uh, deployed militia, again, uh, kept uh, enforced uh, security, increased security throughout the region. But there are, again, these important distinctions um, that have little to do with the rest of Iraq. One of them, one of this distinct, I would call it the schizophrenic opposition. On the one hand, they're calling for uh, citizenship rights. You know, the, the Kurds are now, in some ways, uh, calling for uh, attention to human rights. Journalists have their own claims. They want freedom of the press. Um, but it's also driven by Kurdish nationalist interests. So instead of demanding the dissipation of the Kurdistan regional government, they're actually calling for more legitimate government where the Peshmerga are unified, the opposition wants a Kurdish constitution, the opposition students are calling for Kirkuk to be incorporated into the Kurdistan region, and some are even demanding better relations with Baghdad. This isn't, you know, for a protest movement, they're actually making some of the same claims as the Kurdistan regional government. And so it's very difficult. Where does that put Goran? It puts Goran in, in, in a very difficult situation. That is, it wants to oppose the Kurdistan regional government in her bill, but then there's the overriding, overriding concern is how the Kurds remain unified in Baghdad. So how did they respond in the beginning? We, we will settle this ourselves. We can't do this. Be good. Don't be traitors to, 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 to Kurdish nationalism because we can't let this be settled in Baghdad. So, what are some of the repercussions of this, as, as Marina was discussing, is not only has it created stirs between the government and its people, but the government within itself in the north. And you're seeing these revived tensions now coming up between the PUK and the KDP. The KDP is now saying, look, you can't even control your own region. And they're, they're quite angry with the PUK. You know, look, look, look what you did because you can't control Suleimania. And now this has turned into a war between Goran and the KDP. 
and 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 all and all sorts of of, of inter-party problems uh, emerging. Now, the Kurdistan regional government, their responses have also been seeped in nationalism and reaffirming Kurdish autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Baghdad. Um, again, like I said, there has been authoritarian uh, repression, there has been increased security, and of course, attempts to reform, calling emergency parliamentary meetings, uh, promising they're still committed to democracy. Um, very, very concerned to maintain this image that the Kurdistan region is the other Iraq. This is one of the overriding um, issues that we can't let it get out that we're like the rest of the country. Uh, and, and to make sure that this is confined to Suleimania. So what, what has the KRG done? You know, some of these, you know, they've also used the social media, just as the protesters in other countries have used social media, media to mobilize. The KRG has also uh, engaged in some very creative ways of fostering uh, nationalism. Um, and if, if you look at in one of the popular KDP newspapers, it's called Howler um, in her bill, and it's a K, you know, it comes out, uh, it's a weekly. Uh, one of, there's a horoscopes, and one of the horoscopes that just came out said after the protest, do not protest against the authorities. Be close to the authorities. If you are not, your destiny will be in danger. <laughs> um, and you'll see again in the, the newspapers, how are they framing this? Those who do not are involved in the protests are those who do not love Kurdistan. Now, this is this play that's going on that if you if you struggle or if you challenge this notion of the Kurdish authorities or the Kurdistan regional government, you are a traitor to the cause. It used to be directed at Baghdad and regional states. Now it's being directed at the opposition. And so the opposition itself is, 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 is in a bind. It has to protect Kurdish national interests in Baghdad. But on the other hand, the opposition is criticizing the Kurdistan region in the north. So, and then, of course, how can the Kurd what, what are the other, some of these other consequences politically? How are you going to deflect this, not only so that you can maintain unity, but that you can show the world that we're OK? So to create new crisis, to displace, to displace the attention that the Kurds do not want on their region is to create more crises. One is that, not surprisingly, and it happened the same thing happened in 2006 when the students revolted in Halabja, was the next day they found Al-Qaeda in Iran. And yes, there probably were some in, in influences, but, but not surprisingly, there was all of a sudden an outbreak and Al-Qaeda was found in Suleimania two days later and they had to deflect and, 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 and deploy uh, many of their Peshmerga. And of course, uh, reaffirming Kurdish autonomy by mobilizing, people know that this whole mobilization of 6,000 troops now, are around the Kirkuk region. And um, they've added now a new front line, and there's now Kurdish Peshmerga increased along the disputed area of Kirkuk south to Mosul, and of course along the greater Zab area too. Before, you would have had Baghdad mobilize its forces, have a, a, a lockdown, have a confrontation, and in fact, the Kurds are still there. They're saying that they're going to leave, but they know that Baghdad is so preoccupied with its own problems that they are going to push the limit and show the population, again, to rebring the Kirkuk issue up. It's not surprising. Two days ago in the Baghdad parliament, Talibani says Kirkuk is the Jerusalem of Kurdistan. Two days in the midst of all of this, because he can, because Baghdad has its problems. The Kurds know that they can also, again, push this nationalist issue and challenge this opposition and say, okay, um, is Goran going to do this? And uh, on its own uh, path, Goran knows that it is, it is stuck. So these are some of this, these, these, these oddities, I would say, about the opposition that are actually tempering or limiting what it actually can do and how much they actually can uh, change th the system. Um, finally, or finally, if you look at, I want to talk about again how limited the opposition is. Where is it taking place? It's only taking place in Suleimania. It doesn't mean that it's not uh, significant in the, in the attention that it's given, but there are no protests in Duhok and Erbil. And, 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 the, and the dozens of people I've spoken to over the past week have said the same thing in Erbil. We are against it. We think that the government reacted uh, with excessive force, but we are not going to go out and complain about it publicly. People are just too afraid. 
So one of it is this fear of, uh, of, of repression or a fear of authoritarian uh, rule in Erbil and Suleimania, where Barzani control is very strong. You can do it in Suleimania because there's nobody running Suleimania, really. And it's, it's, it's a Garan stronghold. PUK has hardly any influence there. They, they have influence, I should, excuse me. They have the militia there, but they don't have popular support. So, but it's not only, um, so you can look again, there has been no opposition in Duhok and Erbil or sustained. And so I, I don't really see this as, as moving across classes um, or regions the way uh, a stronger opposition movement would have uh, would happen. But it's not just about potential opposition. If you look at the nature of the Kurdistan region too, these two parties, you know, there is no private sector. There is no real civil society. Civil society is created, financed, and controlled by the Ministry of Interior. If you want to have a protest, you have to ask permission. In the very, very beginning, even before this process happened, when, when somebody was shot, Garan asked, and, and everybody immediately was having these protests, Garan asked permission from the Kurdistan regional government, and they said no. So Garan said, okay, we're sorry, we won't have it. So they didn't have the protest. And then later, students had it on their own. And even then, Garan will say, we have nothing to do with, we didn't do these protests. This is done by the people. So there's so much of people's dependency tied still to this Kurdistan regional government financially, that jobs, uh, politically, your, your positions, anything is, 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 is linked to the KRG. If you protest against them, not only you, but your family will be out of a job. Um, so there, there is the sense still of uh, people versus government is not as developed. You have uh, tribal leader and tribal members. You have the sense of the big daddy syndrome taking care of its populations. And this will become a bigger issue as the Kurdistan region increases its revenues from Baghdad with the oil rents. This year, the KRG's got $10 billion as its, na its annual budget given to it from Baghdad. It's a lot of money. And so either there will be the return to co-optation, the increase of the distributive function of the government, which I would see, moving away from attempts to democratize by co-opting, and, and an increase in, 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 the, in the gap between the wealthy and the poor. Uh, but that does not necessarily translate into mobilization against the government. Um, so whereby the, we, we saw in Egypt or, or possibly in the rest of Iraq, the opposition probably could garner support in other areas, whether that be Nasiriyah, whether that be Basra, overthrowing the local provincial council in Basra. That's probably not going to happen in the Kurdistan region. Um, even though the local populations are unanimous in their in disgruntlement, um, few outside of Suleimania, and whether that be Kalar or Halabja, are going to, to, to revolt. Um, what does this mean, again, uh, for the relations between the Kurdistan region and Baghdad, or how is this playing out? Um, the Kurds, re regardless of this protest, are going to take advantage as much as possible to Baghdad's weakness. You know, the Kurds will say to you, the, the, the greatest thing that can happen was Baghdad is unstable, because that will allow the Kurdistan region to continue to smuggle oil revenues to Iran, not pay taxes to Baghdad, push as much as it can in Kirkuk and leave its Peshmerga there and utilize this nationalist. And, and, and this is what I see is, is one of the unintended consequences of these revolts. And of course, the youth movement or this movement is pressing the issue of reform. That has been brought to the attention and they will in, engage in some type of window dressing. There's been emergency sessions at the parliament and all of this bit, but I don't really see um, serious serious change uh, ahead. Barzani has agreed, okay, let's have another election. But you have to be uh, careful about how those elections uh, will be played out. And, and again, um, if you look at the feud, the feuding going on between the parties is likely to continue as well. And this is going to play itself out um, uh, between Garan and the KDP and the KDP and the PUK. Who is going to control Suleimania so that the Kurdistan region does not look like the rest of Iraq? Um, and the blame game will continue after that. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Over to John B. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you know the old adage: everything has been said, but not by everybody. I will add. I will add. I will add. I will add another twist to it. Not in, everything has been said, not by everybody, but not in in all the different accents. So I'll add another one. Um, 
So, um, so as I said, Marina and, 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 and Denise have already given you uh, most of what I wanted to say, but let me just, I, I will focus a little bit more on, 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 the, on some of the macro issues. Um, but before that, let me start with kind of an, an anecdote. I was in northern Iraq two weeks ago, three weeks ago now. It was just at the height of the demonstrations in Tahrir Square in Cairo. And um, so talking to students, talking to go, going to different places, uh, it was very interesting that there was an enormous amount of excitement um, in terms of people watching what was going on, people talking about change, people, the atmosphere was very much imbued with the Tahrir Square um, uh, events. And I, at one point I went to this very, you probably know this cafe in Suli, the old, where all the intellectuals supposedly gather with all the pictures. Of, and there were three huge um, flat screen TVs, all three of them on Al Jazeera, on, on Tahrir Square, and people were cheering essentially for demonstrators. So the question then becomes is that, okay, is this gonna happen here too? Is this you know the, the, the point of our discussion today? Is Iraq next? And the, for the reason, some of the reasons that you heard today, I mean, there is very much um, many differences between Iraq and the rest, of the, the rest of the region, in part because of the decentralized nation, nature of Iraq, in part because many of the, the protests have been localized. There's a way in which what happens in Nasseria stays in Nasseria and doesn't, uh, there's not that contagion, contagion effect within, within Iraq. But fundamentally, I mean, when you compare Iraq with the rest of the, of the region, you, people are not essentially protesting against a regime that has been in power like Gaddafi for 41 or 42 years, or Mubarak for um, what, 30, 30 odd years. So it isn't um, that there is, there is, this is a new system, this is a new, a, a new government, a new regime, and in that sense, the nature of the protests are very different, and very much also focused on the fact that um, the, the lack of services. I mean, Baghdad still has very few hours of electricity. Um, the same is true for the rest of the country, but some parts of the country obviously are doing better. But nonetheless, in terms of services, the government has not succeeded in, in providing some of the basics to the people. So a great deal of the frustration is that it has to do with uh, the services. Now, in, in the Kurdistan region, uh, in a way, it's, it's ironic, but because there you have had uh, uh, leaders who have been in power for a very long time. I mean, if you go back to starting to 1991, uh, after the, the first Gulf War, you've had continuous uh, rule by, by the Barzani and Talabani families, and to some extent you can argue that it is in Kurdistan that people should really rebel and object to essentially to a uh, ossified political system. But even there, I would argue that a great deal of the protests has to do, partially has to do with, with politics, but also has to do with services. Um, now, the, um, the fundamental problem in both Iraq and the KRG is the fact that this, this is, Iraq always was the case, and the KRG is now developing its own uh, uh, brand of, which is rentierism. I mean, that they live off essentially revenues that come from, from oil or gas exports. And to that extent, and the, the politics is really about how do I distribute between, among friends, family, uh, and constituents the, the revenues that come from, uh, from, from oil rents. And from when you look at the KRG, and I'll focus most of my comments now on the KRG, is that you, you have a government today in, in KRG, ironically, who is led by a reformer, who actually has um, all the intentions. I mean, this is some, Baham Saleh, who, who is now the prime minister of the KRG. He is a PUK member. He was in, in Baghdad and, uh, for, uh, after the... Uh, for many many of the years after the the American in invasion, had made a name for himself as a reformer, as a uh, no nonsense technocrat, and he was brought in and in the, in the rotation system between the KDP and PUK became the prime minister. Now Baham Saleh has tried to change many of the things that have uh, that have not worked in terms of more transparency, reforming uh, some some. Uh, mostly the finances and the way money is distributed. 
for instance, one of the things he did was to each political party, the KDP and the PUK, would get $35 million from the uh, central government, central Kurdistan government every year as a subsidy. He cut that down to five. You know, when you talk to the Goran people, they say, well, <clears throat> you, you, when you point that out to them, this, uh, the Goran people also get money. They don't get as much, but they get also money from, from the central government. So everybody is on the take in some ways, even if the take has been to some extent reduced. The problem for Bahamis and, and the, the PUK, uh, I mean, and this, and this administration is that um, he, he, the, 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 the KRG government is, is in many ways a very weak government because especially after the elections when, the, when Goran scored a major victory against the PUK in the PUK controlled uh, province of Suleimania, the PUK itself has been very weakened. And as, and as a result, there's a certain element of illegitimacy in the eyes of its main rival, the KDP, which sees the PUK as a weakened uh, party, party, but had this arrangement and had this deal with the PUK, so it had to turn over the prime ministership. But in reality, the KDP has tried to control many of the ministries surreptitiously. And you see the, the lingering effects of the civil war of the 1990s still being felt at every level of society in between the KDP and the PUK. It, it, from, the, from the guards at the, at the ministries who, who, if you're a KDP guard, you, you will tend to harass the PUK people coming in, etc. So there is a great deal of disunity in, in the uh, in, in the north, there are two Peshmerga organizations that have never been unified. There are two intel, uh, uh, Asayish, two intelligence organizations that have not been unified. So, so this division is actually hampering a great deal the ability of the of the uh, the government to to operate. Secondly, the PUK itself is quite divided. Um, uh, Baham Baham has the was placed there essentially by the president of Iraq, Jalal Talabani, the head of the PUK. But in reality, many of the things that he has tried to do has also um, ruffled feathers within the PUK, which means that within the PUK, it's not clear to me how much support he has. And there's a great deal of attempt at undermining everything he does. So here you have a genuine reformer uh, who is really stuck between the KDP on the one hand, his own party on the other. And I have to say the Goran opposition, in some ways, it was, a, it was quite refreshing for them to, to make this uh, the breakthrough and kind of jolt the system. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, my sense is, and, uh, from watching uh, Goran and, and, and talking to their leaders, is that they don't have that much to offer except to say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And, and to the extent that the vitriol, especially against, um, against Baham Saleh, who should have been the, in some ways a natural ally for them, because they do think in some ways, at least theoretically, the same way, you, you find the vitriol getting actually uh, quite, quite severe. And so the Goran is not, is criticizing, but is not offering something in return. Now, so the problem, but, uh, but fundamentally, so the, everything boils down to, to, to the nature of the, of the, of the economy in, in the KRG. At some level, you see an enormous change in the KRG. I mean, not only five-star hotels that are uh, going up, uh, you have uh, malls being uh, de developed, lots of malls with the latest technology, the latest gadgets, the, uh, the luxury, luxury items, et cetera. Uh, but this is all f uh, the result of the monies that are being used up from oil revenues. And you heard uh, Denise say that you know, the way the Iraqi uh, government, the Iraqi oil uh, issue works is that all revenues go to the central government and the Kurds get 17% of the budget. Not exactly 17%, it's actually less than 17% because the Iraqi government deducts certain things from that. But still, it's a sizable chunk of money that comes in and there's no accountability which is true for all the oil um, rentier states in, 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 in the region. And as a result, look at, at the fundamental problem that exists in the KRG, and until this gets solved, and I don't think it can be solved because uh, for what I'm saying in, in a minute, 
the KIG has approximately a population of uh, 4.3 million people. 1.4 million people are actually on the government payroll. Right? So this is a fundamental problem in that there is not production going on. There's a lot of distribution going on. And the KIG, the, 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 the KIG government, for example, has tried to revitalize the agricultural sector. Now, it used to be in the old days that, uh, that Kurdistan was really a very um, successful, almost a breadbasket of the rest of Iraq. And in part because of Saddam's um, policies of destroying the villages, and you know, uh, thousands of villages were destroyed, people were moved or killed, etc. Um, the, the the hardships of the 1990s, when you had the double embargo on both by the by the world and by the Iraq on on northern Iraq, which meant huge deforestation. So agriculture has completely uh, disappeared. Now. Th th the government has tried to, for example, give $7,000 to families to go back to their ancestral villages to restart agriculture. Nobody takes it. I mean, why would you do it? I mean, in a way, it's, it's quite um, uh, logical. Why would you go back to, to your village, start trying to make a living from, on agriculture, when you can have a government job and, and, have, and, and live in, in, in one of the urban areas or semi-urban areas, and a government job is, let's say, face it, is a secure job, right? So th th it's been very, very hard for, for the KRG government, even with the best of intentions, to resuscitate, to revive, um, um, uh, re revive the uh, economic activity, I mean, productive economic activity. I mean, I'm saying there's a lot of economic activity, and in some ways the good news is that you're seeing a great deal of integration between between the Turks uh, 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 and the KRG in the sense that the Turkish companies are all over the place. I mean, from banks to, to uh, the wash, wa washing machine makers to television makers, all every, everything is, uh, a lot of the stuff is being sold um, uh, is uh, is Turkish. I mean, the only people I think who are um, giving, starting to give the Turks a little bit of a run on their money is the other Chinese who are now coming in for, and you you have these Chinese malls uh, with Chinese flags and Chinese um, uh, people working that uh, selling stuff. But be, so so that integration is working, but still it's based on oil revenues. So so what 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 are the um, the uh, the future, uh, what we should look at in the, in the future. Technically, in October of this year, uh, this, the, the Baham Saleh's term ends as prime minister. And it should revert back, the prime, the prime ministership should revert back to the KDP. Now, the KDP had it for two terms before that, um, and it, it is possible that Baham may get a second term. But what is very murky at the moment is who decides that? It's probably going to be Barzani, but what are the, why, how is he going to make that decision? And I think here the protests will make a difference because there's a way in which it may be convenient for him to keep Baham in, in, in power because it, when you talk to people in, 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 in the KRG, I mean, there is some genuine support for, for, for Baham and what, for what he's trying to do, even though people recognize that he's not um, uh, very strong. That said, it may be convenient for the for the for Barzani to push on the um, the uh, keep Baham as, as prime minister, only because it will deflect a little bit the protest from from um, uh, from the KDP and, and him. Because there's a way in which, because of the weakened status of the PUK, if there is an increase in in them, in opposition, it will now be increasingly focused on on the KDP and, and Barzani because for reasons that Denise also mentioned, is the, the PUK is too weak in that sense. Why are you going after, and also Suli Mania is a much freer um, part of the country. So it's, it, the, the danger is that Barzani may be at the receiving end. So, but the one funny thing is that Barzani was in Italy recently and he said, if 50,000 50, people sign up a petition, sign a petition saying I should uh, resign, I will. And of course, immediately there was a Facebook page that was launched uh, in Kurdistan and, um, uh, to date, there's 35,000 signatures, and I, I'm sure they're going to go over uh, over the number very quickly. Is he going to resign? Of course not. But but in a way, it shows you a little bit his own <laughs> inability to. 50,000 is not a very large number. I mean, um, uh, of people. So he's a little bit out, 
if you want out of touch. So with that, so the, the clinical thing will be um, what happens in October and whether or not the KDP will feel th th threatened and will try to deflect uh, attention from, from problems by um, keeping uh, uh, Baham Saleh and also playing more the, the nationalist card because that's always the most convenient way of um, deflecting uh, problems. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Henri. Let's open it up. Can you please just uh, state your name and affiliation and hopefully limit it to a question? No one wants to be the first to, uh, <laughs> please. <laughs> Uh, good morning, journalists from Turkish Embassy. Can you please a little bit talk about Iran's role in, in, on, in all of this? Because when we read and listen to the Iraqis and you know what's going on in the Kurdistan region, they point towards Iranian influence, and Iranian influence is the big thing in all this game, the government formation process still. Um, is this a pretext to deflect attention in both parts of the country, or is Iran is real trying to take advantage of what's going on. Okay. Daniel Morrow, Johns Hopkins says. Uh, the question is, uh, do you have an idea of the reaction of the Turkish uh, government uh, about this situation in Iraq, especially uh, about Kurdistan, of course? Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, Faisal al from the Kuwait Embassy. I have a question for Mrs. Otway. Uh, you mentioned uh, um, Al Malki's uh, statement regarding 100 days, uh, probably delaying the protests. Um, do you have any kind of analysis or any prediction what could possibly happen after 100 days of delaying the protests? Will it affect the government? Will it uh, uh, help uh, um, strengthen the government's stance? I have a, a, a small second question for Mrs. Uh, Natalie. Um, I'm not sure, but isn't uh, Suleimani a province under the control of uh, Talibani, not Quran? Just oh, yeah. any clarification on that, please. Thank you. OK, one more before we. Okay, let's start with Marina then. Okay, um, let me start with the issue of the Iranian influence and I limit my comments simply to what I continue calling, <clears throat> I have a great deal of trouble finding the word to define uh, the part of Iraq I'm talking about. I talked about Iraq proper before. Denise is talking about central and southern Iraq. Very frankly, I think the discussion that we have that shows how the protest is unfolding, I think it's clearer and clearer that we have two separate entities here. One is Iraq and the other one is Kurdistan. And uh, with a political dynamics that have totally different uh, logic. So let me talk about Iraq essentially and not about, uh, let me call it Iraq and not, uh, uh, and that exclude Kurdistan. Iranian influence. Now, do we know that uh, uh, there, there has been Iranian influence in the country all along? We don't know how determinant it is. I mean, one of the things that we have seen in the process of government formation is that definitely the Iranians have the, some influence, but they certainly did not have determined an influence. We ended up with a government in Iraq that was supported, that was, uh, w with a prime minister in Iraq, that was the one that both the United States and Iran wanted at that point. So it's a, it's a very paradoxical situation. I, we have not seen anything specific that would allow us to say the, uh, the uh, uh, Iran is manipulating the, uh, manipulating the unrest. 
we can, uh, we can uh, the sort of uh, formulate all sorts of hypotheses. For example, well, Moqtada Sadr is close to the Iranians, and Moqtada Sadr is trying to take advantage of the situation, and so on. Very frankly, I think it's more of an opportunist move on the part of the uh, uh, on the part of the uh, uh, of Sadr rather than part of a, you know overall overarching plan that includes uh, that includes Iran. Uh, let me add, so I'm skeptical essentially about this issue that this has been manipulated by, uh, by Iran. Uh, let me add that we are hearing this issue about the Iranian influence whenever there is unrest anywhere in that part of the world. So that, you know, it, and I think, you know, short of a real clear proof, I think I'm very, I'm very skeptical about this. The 100 days, I mean, first of all, uh, Maliki is not postponing, uh, it has not succeeded in preventing uh, protest during the 100 days. He's talking about it, protest is going on, has continuing, has been continuing, so he has not uh, prevented. I don't know what and as I said, he never formulated anything specific. He has not uh, said, you know, by the end of 100 days, such and such power plant has to have repaired whatever it has to repair or anything, anything very specific. So very frankly, I don't think there are going to be any clear consequences at the end of the 100 days, except that probably people like Saleh and Mutlak will say, well, it's time now for Maliki to step down and so on. But I don't see that as a deadline you know, things will be really different after the 100 days are over than they are now. It's more of a rhetorical statement, I would argue. Can I, yeah, can I, I just add to Marina's comment on Iran's role? I'll look at the North. I, com I completely agree with Marina as well um, that um, if you ask, is it a pretext or, you know, Iran trying to take advantage, um, there will always be the Iranians did it. You know, particularly in those, remember that the northern area shares, a, particularly in the Suleimania region, a large part of its border with Iran. So there are, rightly so, we, we don't have exact evidence, but Iranian influence was particularly in the Halabja area. And it was easy to say when they had the Halabja revolts, which also involved killing uh, 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 protesters, that the Iranians instigated it. Um, now, there are very clear economic ties. The, the, the Kurdistan regional government, led by Barham Saleh, has made a couple of trips over to Iran in the last six months, assuring that they, absolutely, they want to establish economic ties with Iran, that they are looking for investment opportunities, that they want to buy electricity from Iran to supply some of the border areas in Penjrin and Meriwan where they have substations set up. So that, you know, that is clear. That has been said that the, the KRG will have or establish and maintain these relations. They cannot jeopardize that border being closed. There's too much money coming through right now. So um, with that said, you can play the Iranian card the way you, you want to play it. On security measures, you can say this was, you know, but I, I, I would lean toward the pretext issue more than I would that there was a large calculated scheme. Um, if I can answer this gentleman's question about Suleimania, it's a really good question. Um, technically, technically, one would say the Kurdistan Democratic Party is now controlling Dehuk and Erbil, and PUK now has Suleimania. Uh, certainly, by security, you know the, they, the, the militia or this this uh, anti-terrorist squad that runs around the city with black hats and you know to, to, to make sure there's and certainly by the mono, the control by the Nokon group of any any contract and any business going on in the region, and that's a conglomerate of old PUK. That is clearly PUK. You can't go through in the tribal areas a, a, a checkpoint without passing through NOCON. They'll, they'll send you by. By popular support in the city, no. And now, if you look at the election results, the first election, it was Garan. So Garan, now, you know, Talibani lost support in his hometown of Koisinjak and Suleimania. The PUK, in terms of popular support, has significantly stepped back. In the last election, the PUK gained some seats, we don't know, you know, in the outlying rural areas. Garan lost some seats, but they still won the city. So it depends which part of Suleimania you're talking about. But in terms of popular support, no. In terms of security and money, yes. Um, a few things on, on Iran. Um, I will answer the Iran question a little bit differently. 
um, one of the things that the um, leadership in in the Kurdish regions were worried about, and actually in some ways amazed in terms of the way the United States dealt with Mubarak, was the perception was that he was a he was an ally of the United States being dumped as soon as the protests had started. So. The Kurds, in many ways, uh, were actually quite distraught by the fact that if the United States dumps an ally of so many years so quickly, what about us? So that's, that's in many ways, the subtext. The, because when you look at the KRG's dealings with either Iran or Turkey, the KRG doesn't have any choice. I mean, that's the that's geography it lives in. That's a, you know, that, th these are the main uh, influences over, um, over northern Iraq. And those are the people they do, they do business with. And th those are the people who have enormous amount of influence in the KRG by virtue of uh, controlling water, controlling uh, electricity, controlling the trade. And uh, to, so the KRG will do business with both and will do business and 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 in many ways think it can it can make deals that will that benefit from it that said there is still a certain amount of ambivalence with respect about the about the Iranians in in the KRG but it is mostly that the big biggest worry i would say for the KRG leadership is from what, what they say, from, the, from their perspective, is the absence of American policy it's in, in the North. That there is no American, real American presence as a PRT, but that's, that, that's about it. They think that they, and to some extent I think they're right, from 2003 onwards, the Americans have taken them for granted and I said, oh, this place, this part of the country is stable, it works, so we don't have to worry about it. And in some ways, the, 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 the curse feel to, to abandon. Um, so, it, under those circumstances, they will of course make deals and they will make uh, 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 with their neighbors. I think the answer to, in terms of how do the Turks look at, at, at this, uh, there's a member of the, uh, the Turkish embassy here who can give you a much better answer than I can, but look, the, the northern Iraq has emerged as a very important source of um, trade for, for Turkey. Uh, Iraq itself is among the uh, the, the top the top uh, I think the top five countries Turkey tr trades with, but if you just take the KRG, it will be among the top ten. So uh, I there's a way in which looking at uh, from a Turkish perspective, I mean Turkey has become if you want the status quo. Part. T Turkey wants that relationship with the KRG to continue to improve, uh, and to the extent that there is. Um, Something I was going to mention. I mean, uh, more oil uh, revenue. I mean, more oil discoveries in the north. More uh, gas as uh, the largest gas discovery that was announced a couple months ago. All of these things uh, make the KRG even more interesting for for Turkey. And if you think about the Nabucco oil, uh, I'm sorry, gas pipeline that is always being questioned whether or not it can or cannot be built. Iraqi Kurdish gas now it becomes a very important factor. So there's a way in which Turkey is very much interested in the stability of the North because it is in its own interest. Now, the other aspect, of course, of the North that is very important for Turkey is its influence on Turkish Kurds. And there, too, you see that irrespective of who you speak to, from Goran to the KDP to the PUK, to that there is, there is a very distinct sense in um, uh, in the north, that the armed struggle should end, that the PKK sh should disband itself, and that uh, the Turkish Kurds should give the AKP a chance to resolve the problem. So from the, from the AKP government in Ankara, this is, you know, exactly what they wanted to, they want to hear. So there's a way in which the two, the two are coming closer and closer. Okay. Let's take a second round. More questions? Let's go on. Please, sir. Doug Fox, Doug Fox, for independent consultant. Um, I'm wondering about in Kirkuk. Are there have there been uh, demonstrations, protests there, and if so, how are they directed, and at what?
Anyone else? I'm here with Angana from, from Kurdish Service Voice of America. Um, my question is for Denise, please. I want to know what's, what's going to be future of Kirkuk? I mean, as we know, part of like what you think, basically. Uh, easy question. <laughs> Big, no easy. problem. <laughs> it's easy. Okay. Any more? Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to answer this question. <clears throat> Can I answer the question on Kirkuk? Uh, first, uh, the easy. Not easy, but yeah, the, the, yes, um, after the Suleimania demonstrations, there were planned demonstrations in, in, in Kirkuk. Now, this is when uh, the, the Kurdistan regional government or the authorities in Kirkuk mobilized, again, there are 6,000 forces right now in the, along the area, Turkmen and Arab populations, and, and this, this is even before this, protesting against the Kurdish monopolization and, 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 uh, of Kirkuk, and the Kurds going there to prevent more demonstrations that have already occurred. So they, there, there was there, there was attempted some few, but that cannot be confused with the already existing uh, tensions going on between Kurds pressing too far into to Kirkuk. So so that was intertwined with, but that happened for like a day. So and then that was dispersed. But there are still more important issue is there are still large Peshmerga forces inside the city, which is aggravating absolutely aggravating uh, the situation right now among the Turkmen and Arab populations because they are also going near Arab controlled areas. The Kurds saying we have to prevent the instability going to Kirkuk, we've got terrorism issues. So yes is the answer. To this question, um, I, you know, years ago, when, when, when Article 140 was supposed to be, you know, December came, and everyone's saying it's going to be passed, and I said it'll never happen. Not to just be, it, it's not going to happen. Now, there were some opportunities. There were some opportunities for this possibly to be negotiated, and the Kurds have said themselves, they so mishandled Kirkuk. I do not see, um, if the Kurds think that, that they were abandoned, this is, this is absolutely um, ridiculous because the most favored community in Iraq since 2003 has been the Kurds. This constitution was drawn up and made by the Kurds, and so much so that it has antagonized and disfranchised Arab populations. So if you want to see where some of this tension is, you've got to look at the constitution, which has pretty much given the Kurds an inordinate amount of autonomy that they've never experienced before. Now, this goes back to Kirkuk. What has happened on the ground um, particularly after the mishandling of Kirkuk and the going in the provincial council and the Kurds taking, you know, you, you can't speak Arabic, you can't speak Turkish, is that there has been a repercussion. Not only, and Kirkuk is symbolic of other parts of the region, that the Kurds have overstepped their autonomy, that they have become increasingly arrogant and un unwilling to compromise, so that populations that in 2003, particularly Shia populations, were saying, you know, let's give the poor Kurds, let's give them a break, they suffered, we suffered. Now they're saying, we will never ever negotiate Kirkuk. And so there has almost been a consolidating of views of, of um, Kirkuk is not going to be part of the, of the Kurdistan region. And the Kurds, with their Peshmerga forces, you're going to have this standoff. What the problem is now is as the Kurds move and press the boundary, right? Now you have, again, uh, they're along the, the Kirkuk from south to Mosul. They're, they're, they're pressing it. Now you're getting into more complicated issues. How are you going to get them now to move back? They could. This will go back and forth on a security issue. I, I don't see this anything other than having a special status, uh, a special status position for years to come. Um, and, uh, but I, I just I, there's just no way, particularly in the current situation now, with Baghdad, Baghdad's power disfranchised, with uh, so excessive regionalism, with Arab communities and Turkmen communities in Kirkuk already concerned about excessive Kurdish autonomy, how this can be resolved in the favor of one group or another right now. So special status uh, situation, but again, somebody's, a neutral party is going to have to oversee that. And, and the concern is when the American troops fully pull out. I, I'm a bit negative. <laughs> Sorry. Comment, I think, before we, okay. Thank you so much.